Hello, Hello everyone in podcast listening land. I'm Karen Devaney. And I'm Ann Barner. And, and we're, we're sisters. sisters. Welcome to Sugarcoated Murder, where we'll discuss and probably inappropriately laugh about and comment on. Yep, one of our favorite subjects murder. murder. Oh, and we love to bake. And why not combine our two favorite subjects baking and killers? Karen Devaney. Hey, Ann Varner. Happy 2020. Welcome to a new decade. New day, a new decade, a new year, a new month. It's all new in the zoo. Yeah, and let me tell you how I started off 2020. I got it right this year. Okay. Already winning. Okay. I posted last night, happy new year, happy birthday, happy Easter, like all the holidays, Merry that. Christmas. I'm done. That You're way done. I don't have all the guilt that I have for pressure. darn it. Why didn't I wish that Facebook friend happy birthday? And She's so much I feel so bad about myself. You should. And then people do it to me, and I feel like everybody needs a thank you note. And it just, it's too it's much. It's too much pressure. It's too much. It's so I'm starting much. the year off with I wish everybody everything. Yeah. Leave me alone. Leave me be. Right. I really started off the new year in not such a great way because I have brought my cold from 2019 into 2020, and I had really hoped that with the dropping of that ball last night, that my cold would just be gone. Right. And it turns out it's not. I'm so sorry. Me too. It's been one week. So they say it's, it's, what do they say? A cold takes 14 days or two weeks. You pick. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it seems like it's true, but I'm, you know, I'm drugging the hell out of myself. So. Right. But during this podcast, I'm going to try really hard not to cough, sneeze, or clear my throat incessantly, which I probably will do all three. And um, if I sneeze, I, I'm hoping that I don't pee my pants. Oh, shoot. That's <laughs> another thing I should have done on Facebook. I, I'm, I, did, I oh, should have yeah. put bless you. God bless you for all your future oh. sneezes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Damn it. And I'm sorry if you're not feeling well. And I hope you recover from whatever surgery. And if you tripped and fell, I hope you get better soon. Right. Oh, I might have to, to go and amend. <laughs> yeah, you're going to have to. <laughs> going to have to amend your post. I'll have to add. Yeah, an addendum. An addendum to my former yes. post of so 2019. Before you start, I have to ask you this question. Okay. Well, first of all, I'm going to tell you that every time I come over and I come in your go and I'm waiting for your elevator, I always think that when it opens, people are going to oh. because your elevator makes the creakiest noises all the way down. Yes. And I always think there's somebody like moving around in the elevator and it always catches me off guard. When it opens and there's nobody there. Yes. It's very scary. It is very, very it's scary. A, Imagine really if your dog freaky. has the runs and you have to take him out at 4 o'clock in the morning. No, I'd be flying down them steps. I <laughs> well, I've tried that, elevator. but unfortunately I have trifocals uh, and yeah. I find it difficult to find all the steps as I'm going down. Yeah, and I've sometimes seen you fall I'll down fall. steps before and that ain't pretty. It's either. not pleasant. It ain't pretty. So I have to endure the creaky elevator and yeah. just pray that, pray that I get there. <laughs> yeah, I don't blame you. Gosh. Well, so anyway, the other thing I was going to ask you is I was binge watching one of the paranormal shows because not only are we obsessed with murder, we are also obsessed with paranormal and spiritual stuff. Yeah. Now, there's your dog giving you an issue already. Yes. It's fine. <clears throat> it's fine. Go ahead. Just pick him up. He's welcoming the new year, too. Yes, he is in quite a sassy attitude. Sassy. So anyway... I was watching it, and they were at they were in Colorado um, at a, an old gold mining site. Ooh, fun! And they were going down into the mines, right? And they so the miners that were there um, were t telling them about these things called Tommy knockers. Have you ever <laughs> heard of that? I I've thought. heard the phrase Tommy knocker, but I don't know okay. what it is. So. And so I asked my husband because, if he had ever heard of that because both of his grandfathers were miners. They were coal miners. Oh. And he said, absolutely. And I was like, are you kidding me? What is it? Well, they're like, um, I, I would only say they're like trolls there, but they can take on also the appearance of a human. Oh. But they knock down in the mines, way down in the mines. So it's not a people, tool. I was thinking it was a mining tool. No, that's the thing. It's, it's a not, ghost. It's actually a, like a, it's like a little, um, 
it's a non-human being. Oh, wow. And they exist supposedly down in the mines. And some people think that they, um, they are the owners of the mines. Okay. And that they can be evil and they can cause erosion, cave-ins, things like that. Oh. Some people believed that the Tommyknockers were the spirits of the miners that had died in the mines. Right. And that when they knocked, it was to tell them that there's danger present and a cave-in could happen. Oh, wow. So, um, but Darren said they that his both of his grandfathers, it was um, a custom to take in food and leave it for the tommy knockers oh yes yeah, so, kind of like our nail ladies how they leave their food for buddha, for buddha. yeah so i was just amazed by the whole situation i thought it was really amazing i had never heard of it i haven't heard I of it either pictures of them and they look like um the kind of like when you look at egyptian paintings and they have the the human body form but then their face is kind of distorted and it's slanted down. Right. It's kind of like that. That's what most people thought they looked like. So do you think I have Tommy knockers in my elevator? No, but I did think that today <laughs> when I was because I had just seen the Tommy knocker episode and I had this whole discussion with my husband and the you know because of his his grandfather's being in the mines. And so I was like, I wonder if her elevator has Tommy knockers. Yeah, I can tell you no, is. no, no. They're not Tommy knockers. I think it's just part of having an elevator. They have a lot of trouble with moisture control in our elevator. Okay. And I think that's part of the problem. Okay. Um, because it is very exposed. To as the someone who has many friends in the psychic community, yeah, I can assure you, there's no no bad, no evil here. Okay, so and I don't and I don't know how evil the Tommy knockers were. I'm just going to put this out there in case any of them are listening right now. I'm not saying they were bad. I'm wow. saying there's mixed emotions about what their agenda was. Right. Um, but they did say. I mean, they would have. They went down in this mine. They went like over 300 feet into this mine. Oh hell and no! And of course, it's pitch black. There's nothing. There's no light. I couldn't do it. And there and there one mine that they were in. There's a lady there that's like the safety officer, mm -hmm. and they actually, whoever is down on this mine, whether it's some spirits or a Tommy knocker, they actually call her by name. Oh, wow. <laughs> they always tell her that they want her to come further into the mine. Oh. So, um, but, but what she did say was they had been in the mine, and then they, they kind of got spooked and they left. Right. Um, this mine, I don't know that I would have gone in there, the whole top... The roof of it was wood, and it over the years from the moisture, it starts to erode. Right. So they had gone and put these steel brackets up, almost like steel sawhorses that were really big, just to brace things. But you would see like these wooden, big wooden columns in there where they originally had braced up the mines that were eroding. Oh my gosh! And so, like the tracks to the the um, mining cars that would go down. They were all rusted, and the lady said, "Don't step in the because she, she said you'll see water. Don't step in it because it's caustic from it's all the rust. Oh God, it's built up. Right. And she said it will eat through your shoes. Oh wow. I'm like oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing that you're saying makes me want to go on this tour. No, no. So it was really interesting. Lord, I can remember I went with a dear friend of mine many many years ago to Branson, Missouri, and we went somewhere. I don't even remember what it was called, but we went into a cave. And we went really, really far down, and we were on a cart, and I just was terrified. You couldn't see; it was cold. Can you imagine I can't. going there every day and working there? So God they bless actually them. kept seeing a light, a really in the like way far. It would have been probably five to hundred, five hundred to six hundred feet in front of them, right? Way back, but there would be a very faint light, almost from the like a miner's cap, right? And it would flicker on oh. real softly and then flicker off. And yeah. I was just like, I mean, I can tell you that the the ghost hunters that were in this mine, they were freaked out. I'm sure. The two ladies that went with them, they go in there all the time to check the mines by themselves and all that kind of stuff. And they're like, those women are either badass or they're crazy. Right. They couldn't decide. But they actually were like, because they were like, we'll go a little bit further. And finally, the, the crew said, we're not going any further. We don't feel comfortable. We got to yeah. go. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. No, I couldn't. And yeah. actually, probably watching it would make me... <clears throat> Claustrophobic. claustrophobic. Mm -hmm. It was. It was yeah. very claustrophobic 
feeling because when you walk through there, it's, I mean, it's maybe the width of it is one and a half of your doorways. It's right. not oh, okay. No. And, and you're not, it doesn't, it's not like a ceiling that's as high as the ceilings that we're used to. I mean, that ceiling is right over you. Right. And some men that were in there that were tall, they, they were bent over all day long. In wow. Those lines, so. Thank you, miners. I know. Yeah. And unfortunately, people. Scooby-Doo did me in for, for the miner. <laughs> yes. The miner 49er. 49er. <laughs> yeah. Oh, gosh. What a terrifying episode I that know. was. I know. So anyway, I just wanted to bring that up because I thought it was really interesting that Tommy yes. Hoppers were fascinating to me. I'd never heard of them. And when I said to my husband, because I thought he was going to say, no, nobody's heard of that. I was like, your grandfather's worked in, a, both of them worked in coal mines. Have you ever heard of a Tommy knocker? And he was like, absolutely. I was so taken aback. I was like, and why have you not shared this with me? Wow. Look at up. 2020 starting off. We're already learning something new. Oh, about Tommy knockers. Tommy knockers. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Well, God bless you. So, so I'm in your kitchen. I see you're in Hello. my kitchen and that Over excites here. me. <laughs> So today I am making a sticky toffee pudding cake. Oh, I love sticky toffee pudding. It's a, it's from what I understand, it's a Scottish dessert. Scottish, Scottish, and um, the first time I ever had it was at the Highland Games here in oh, town. Oh, right. I've not it was been. Really good, really super great thing. A little, a little expensive, just to walk in the door. Understood, but it's also typically held during hotter month. It is. In it's crazy. Charleston. Yes. And, but I will tell you, you see a lot of men in kilts. Yeah. And some of them, they don't look too bad. And for that, I might just. It's worth a $20 Find admission. another city where they have it and go there. <laughs> At a cooler time. A cooler time. Yes. So, um, anyway, that's the first time I ever had it. And I thought, oh, it's okay. And then we got it from Trader Joe's because they used to sell it. It was seasonal. It was. And we, and, the Actually, best. You and I ordered like a case of it for our stuff. A case and a half. We we got him a case and a and half us, a case yes. for us to split. And we had sticky toffee pudding for probably a year. Yeah. And now Trader Joe's doesn't sell it. The anymore. year after they yes. stopped selling it. It's like I think they felt like there was an addiction problem maybe. that they were feeding and that they, <laughs> they were like, oh, decided crap. we're going to have to shut this down. Right, <laughs> shut it down. But listen, <laughs> if you make it really good, we can tap into those Trader Joe's buyers. I agree. That are longing for it. And, yes, and or start just go something. sell it out in front of Trader Joe's and say, remember this. Remember this? Do you yeah. miss it too? Exactly. Yeah. And then we, we might be on to something. We could be. Yeah. We could be. We've got lots of plans. All right. Well, you start making so your I'm coffee. So I'm going to be piddling in here and um, I'll talk about the recipe on our break, and I want to hear what you have to say about murder. Oh, murder. Murder. This is a murder that took place in Snellville, Georgia. Snellville. Mm-hmm. Mm. On April 26, 2009, several 911 calls started to come in to the Snellville Police Department. The caller said that a young woman had been shot um, in the parking lot of a Borders bookstore. They said that a man with dark hair, khaki pants, and a blue button-down shirt, like an Oxford shirt, mm -hmm. had walked up to the woman, had words with her, pulled out a gun, shot her in the head, and walked away. Oh, my gosh. Some of the callers attempted to follow that man. Um, they didn't want to get too close because, you know, he had a gun. Um, but he disappeared into a wooded area. The callers also told the dispatcher that there was a small child in the vehicle. Um, police arrived on the scene to find Heather Strube face down on the ground, dead from a, gun, uh, from a bullet wound to the head. The young child in the car was not harmed, thankfully. Wow. Um, about 20 minutes after the police arrived, another caller called and told the police dispatcher that the person who shot Heather was a short, thin man that had a mop of black hair that almost looked like a wig. She actually said, you know, he looked almost like a kid, but he had a mustache and this mop of hair, so you knew it yeah. wasn't a kid. Yeah. Um, and then she reiterated that, that the killer had um, walked into a wooded area, and that's where they, lo <clears throat> they lost him. Wow. So the police engage um, canine handlers, and they try to track the killer through the woods, but the area opened up to a parking lot and K-9 lost the track. So the police started processing the scene and they see Heather's person phone on the front seat of her car and then they, they figure out, okay, if her person or phone's still there, it's probably not a robbery. 
So they start interviewing eyewitnesses at the scene. One person told them that she had seen a man drive up and park his minivan next to Heather's car. He got out with a baby in a diaper bag, handed Heather the baby, and the two exchanged pleasantries, and then the man got back into his van and left. Heather then walked around to the passenger back seat of her car. She put the baby in and walked around to get into the car. At that time, the killer walked up from out of nowhere. Um, Heather and the man argued. He pulled out a gun, shot her, and then casually walked away. Didn't run, wasn't in a rush, just casually walked away. So police um, are able to find some information in Heather's vehicle to help them track down her parents and notify them of what had happened. And they began to ask some questions about the man that dropped off the baby. The man was Heather's ex-husband, Stephen Stroop. He and Heather met when Heather was, <clears throat> they actually met at church when she was a junior in high school, and they started dating. Um, Heather went to college and studied horticulture. She was really into flowers and plants. After she graduated, she and her parents opened a floral store together. Um, Stephen and Heather got married and both of them worked in the flower shop, and Stephen's mother actually volunteered to come in, and she was kind of like the bookkeeper. She took care of paperwork and um, helped him keep everything organized. Um, soon Heather became pregnant. It was at, except three years after they were married. Um, and then in 2007, she gave birth to a son named Carson. After Carson was born, her parents said the, mar the marriage started to fall apart and Heather asked Stephen to talk to some pastors at the church for counseling, but he refused and said he didn't want to go to counseling. Heather could tell that Stephen was no longer committed to the marriage, so in the summer of 2008, she filed for divorce. And you know, sometimes that happens. You, you are married, and you've got a lot going on, and then you've got the added pressure of a baby. Yeah, and that baby will make you or break you. Yeah, it That's changes sure. everything, the whole dynamic. Yes. You, you really have to learn a lot of things over. Um, so Stephen moved out of their home and into his mother's house, and Heather and Carson moved in with her mom and dad. Um, Heather had physical custody of Carson, and Stephen had visitation every other weekend. But they seemed to get along as parent co-parenting, and they, they seemed to be doing relatively good. Um, they, they were in a custody battle over Carson. Um, and the, the divorce was, at this time, very close to being finalized. Um, so they have all the information they, they can get right now from her parents. And they decide to move their investigation over to Stephen's house, see what's going on over there. Um, they start to question Stephen. And they told him um, that Heather had been murdered. And Stephen was visibly shaken and shocked. Like, he... The police investigator said you could tell he had no idea. Wow. He was stunned that, mm -hmm. that she was gone. He immediately asked about Carson, where is he? Where can I go pick him up? Um, they said, you know, he's at the hospital. You can pick him up after we finish talking to you. Mm. And the police asked him to sit down, and they asked if anybody else lived in the house. And he, just, he was like, well, my stepdad, who was the one that answered the door, and his mother. Um, but she, his mom was out of town. So they asked Stephen to come down to the police station to answer some questions, and he agrees. At the station, the investigators asked him to lay out the events of the day. And he said that he had gotten up, fed Carson, they played. Um, he and his mom were hanging around the house. His girlfriend stopped by, they hung out. And then he left the house um, a little before 6 because he had to go meet Heather to drop Carson off. Then they asked what kind of vehicle he drove, and he said, a minivan which matched the story that, that the eyewitnesses had seen a man right. in a minivan pull up. They also asked if there were any other vehicles at the house, and he said his stepdad drove a silver Dodge and his mom drove a white Ford F-150. Mm -hmm. So police were pretty sure after they talked to Stephen that he was not the shooter, but they, didn't, they couldn't rule out that he had something to do with it. Okay. Um, they just it was didn't, like a hired thing. Right. Hired. They just didn't have enough information. But he didn't. He did not fit the description of the shooter because he was tall and had light brown hair, and the shooter was short, thin, and had a black mop of hair. Um, 
out. So um, they did discover that that with the finalization of the divorce, Heather was set to get full custody of Carson. So they kind of kept that in the back of their the back of their caps because you don't know. Divorce mm -hmm. makes people crazy. Cray cray. Cray cray. Completely cray cray. Investigators then go to talk to Heather's parents again. Um, her parents told them that Stephen had been having an affair with his girlfriend because they they said um, when they were talking and he mentioned his girlfriend had come by. He mentioned that he was a, that she was a new girlfriend. So the investigators said, "What do you know about his new girlfriend?" And her mother. Heather's mother said, new girlfriend, this is not a new girlfriend. Like, Stephen had been having an affair. Of when he was married? When he was married, and that's Very the hard. reason they got divorced. Oh. He had fallen in love with this other woman and okay. didn't want to go for counseling because he was done with his Oh, because he was marriage. ready to get out. Right, you know. Yeah, it happens. Right, okay. so they were kind of shocked that he had not mentioned that he had had an affair. Mm. Um, so... Um, the investigators then decide they need to go and talk to this new new old girlfriend. Yeah. <laughs> and her name is Brittany. So they head over to Brittany's house, and they ask her a timeline for her day. She says that she had stopped by Stephen's house. They hung out, Stephen Carson and Stephen's mom. She stated in, um, that Stephen's mom left about 5.15 to go out of town. Brittany stayed with Stephen and Carson until he left to go do the exchange. Um, Heather, um, the investigators then asked her, do you want Stephen to have full custody of Carson? And she hesitated, and she looked at him, and she said, well, actually, no. I don't. Because, and they said, why is that? And she said, because if he has full custody, then that will limit the time that he spends with me. Well, that's honest. <clears throat> Um, she said that she would rather Heather have full custody and Stephen do visitation like it had been. She said that it seemed like a good situation and that she just felt full custody for Stephen would, would end their romance, I guess you could call it. Okay. So, in the meantime, the investigators get a composite sketch um, put together from the description of the eyewitnesses. And I actually saw a picture of this composite sketch <laughs> and the hair on this person, it was like a typical person, maybe kind of sharpish features with a weird mustache, but the hair was just like, it, it reminded me of pasta. It was just stuck everywhere, you know, like, like a broom, almost oh. bristly, you know, the way they just, they, it was just weird. And when you looked at it, you were like, for sure, that had to have been a wig, because who wears their hair that way? Yeah, that's crazy. Even, like, the choppy, messy look, yeah. still, it wouldn't have been, it was a little bit longer. It just was very, it was very odd. They were also able to pull up some surveillance. They didn't get surveillance of the parking lot to see the crime happen, but there was surveillance on the back of the building, and they did see the shooter coming and going. So they could see that weird hair. Oh, yeah. Well, I would imagine that kind of weird hair would stick out on the surveillance. Right. Camera. It did. It definitely did. So you actually see in the surveillance this man walking to the crime and walking. He was never, he wasn't walking fast. It's just very casual. It's just like. Any other day. Bam. And I'm just going to walk away. That's crazy. No big deal. No biggie. So they decide to release the sketch um, to the news hoping that somebody out there would say, hey, I saw this weirdo. I think I have more information. Well, it paid off. Oh. They got a call from a guy, a truck driver, that had been staying at a hotel that was just on the other side of the wooded area mm -hmm. where the shooter disappeared. So they go over to the hotel, and they're like, what'd you see? The man says, well, I was outside smoking a cigarette, and I saw the man in that composite sketch sitting in the truck and he looked really weird you could tell he was in disguise he kept checking his watch he seemed really tense and he got out of the truck and walked away and he said then i didn't really think anything of it i just thought it was really weird until i saw the news with the sketch right and i was like wait a minute i saw that guy mm -hmm. so now they know he walked through the woods mm -hmm. got into a truck at the hotel and bolted 
Okay. But the truck driver remembered that it was a Ford F-150 white truck with black trim. And he said for that type of older model Ford, the black trim on it was rare. Wasn't something that you saw very often. Mm -hmm. So they were like, okay, ding, ding, ding. Somebody that we've talked to said something about a white truck. Yeah. Right. Stephen's mom. Right. That's what I thought. Right. She had, quote, unquote, gone out of town. Right. So what would you do next? I'll go arrest that bitch. Well, you might just want to talk to her first. Oh, (laughs) that's why I'm not a police officer. (laughs) You might just want to take a step back. My bad. (laughs) Yeah. They actually asked the truck driver if he could, if he, if you saw the truck again, would you recognize him? He said, sure. Mm-hmm. So they said, you want to take a ride with this? And they drove by Stephen's house. Mm-hmm. Sure enough, there was the truck. Holy moly. And the truck driver said, that is the truck for sure. Mm. So um, the investigator said, you know, we, we need to go have a sit down with Stephen's mom. So they go over and they start talking to Stephen's mom. Her name is Joanna. Joanna Strube. Joahanna. Joahanna. <laughs> and she told them that she had been at home until just before Stephen left to go meet Heather. She said that she left to go visit her parents in Luthersville, which was about an hour and a half, unless you hit traffic in mm-hmm. Atlanta, then it would take about three hours, but typically an hour and a half away. She said that she had stopped along the way for an ice cream at a restaurant and that she thought she had a receipt in her truck to verify she was where she said she was. So naturally, police say, hey, You're by the way, oh, hey, no, by the not. way, uh-huh. we've got a, um, a warrant, not a warrant, what is it called? Okay. A search warrant, that's what it is, <laughs> for your truck. So we're going to take your truck. Oh, so if there's a receipt in there, never you we'll mind find you it. get that. Right. So, and she was like, well, I don't know why you would want my truck, but go right ahead. Because well, your truck was in a murder, you dumbass. Right. So they impound her truck and they start looking. And it was really interesting. This was actually an episode of um, Murder Calls on ID Discovery that I saw. But one thing, I guess I don't watch enough true crime, but I'm getting back into it. Okay. Yeah. It's easier to talk about than watch. It's hard to watch. It's scary. It's a little scary. (laughs) Am I using this for the brown sugar? Yeah. Okay. So um, they... The... People that process the crime scene. I'm sure there's a name. The CSI technician? Sure. Sounds yeah. good. Okay. Crime scene investigator. Whatever. That would be a CSI. So what they do is they've, they've got these big, huge pieces of tape. Mm-hmm. And they put them down on the carpet. They pat it down and then they lift it. Um, yes. And then they preserve it. And they see all the treasures. How right. many Cheerios are under your seat? Right. But. <laughs> food wrappers. This, and... car, this truck was very, very clean inside. Oh. oh very, very was. clean inside. Right. They did find the receipt in the ashtray. Okay. Okay. That's good to know. But when they lift that tape up, the investigator says, huh, there really isn't anything on this floor, but there's just this one fiber was it black? And it's black. Was it? And it looks kind of weird. Yeah, like right? a stupid broom wig. It doesn't feel like hair. It doesn't seem like hair. But, yeah, we, we have something, and it's and it's like four or five inches long, and it's, it's like a fiber. So they sent it off to the crime lab. Then they, they start looking at the receipt for the ice cream. Uh-huh. It's Tom stamped at 7.19 p.m. Right, so Stephen dropped Carson off at six, mm-hmm. and he left. Right, so the investigators are like, "Well, I wonder how far away this restaurant is." So three of them meet in the parking lot where the hotel is, mm-hmm. where the truck was parked, and they all three leave at six o'clock, and they drive different routes. To in different speeds, some of them were going a little fast, some of them were going the speed limit a little faster just to see. Mm-hmm. They ended up there in an hour and 20 minutes. Okay, so that says, Okay, you really were there, 
and she thought it was going to be an alibi. Unfortunately, it puts her at the scene of the crime of at course. just the right time. Yeah. Right. So <laughs> she's thinking that she's, you know, all that in a bag of chips because she stopped there for ice cream. Nobody <laughs> likes you. They should have said you're under arrest, like I said. Yeah. So um, they get the information back from forensics. And lo and behold, that black fiber um, is to, is confirmed to be a fiber from a black wig. Now Joanne is the prom suspect. Ho, ho bag. Right, but they don't have enough black evidence. Black wig, Aaron, ho bag. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I'm, I mean, I'm not trying to be ugly, but <laughs> black wig, wearing ho bag. Yeah. So... It's now nine days after Heather's murder. Oh. So they decide, but they don't have enough evidence yet to bring Joanna in. So they decide to bring Stephen back in to ask him some questions. And they told Stephen about the wig, fiber, and the receipt. And then they said, Stephen, do you think that your mom could have killed Heather? And he said, absolutely not. So they decide that they're going to show him the surveillance video, which is something they had not released to the public. Um, and that's the video showing the shooter leaving the crime scene. Mm -hmm. And they've got all of this on video. As he watches the video, his face is that of shock. His shoulders fall, and he says, oh, my God, oh, my God. And investigators ask if the person on the tape is his mother, and he says, oh, my God, yes. Oh. He's crushed. He's sobbing. He's like, I can't, she's not that dumb. She wouldn't do this. And he's like, oh, Seems my like God. she is that dumb. Right. He's like, oh, my God. And then the investigators are like, just tell us, is it your mother? And he said, yeah. So they ask him. It takes a lot of convincing. But they ask him if he would try and get his mom on the phone and try to get some kind of a confession or some kind of evidence that they can use. Um, and he calls her and he says, Mom, I'm just leaving the police. And she said, okay. He said, they showed me the video, Mom. It's you. And she said, what are you talking about? It's not me. And he said, Mom, it walks like you. The it's got a movements, stupid black ass wig like you. The movements are like you. I would know my own mother. That is you on the tape. And she said, I don't know what you're talking about. And he said, I got to go and hung up because he couldn't take it. He just couldn't take it. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. That's devastating. <laughs> yeah. But even though they couldn't get that out of her. Um, oh, she did say one thing. I guess they're coming to arrest me tonight. So... Um, they actually call her back in to the police station to ask her some more questions to see if she'll confess. Okay. And she comes in acting like a bitch. Well, of she she does. flips papers on the table and says, well, I guess you don't have enough evidence. When you find whatever it is you're looking for, then you come see me. But you don't have shit. Uh -oh. And then she got up and walked out. She is brazen. Yeah, very much so. Oh, my goodness. So investigators felt otherwise, and they decided they were just going to go arrest her. Mm. <laughs> Hello. Could have done that two days ago. Like I said. Yeah. Um, she never confessed. Her trial started in May of 2011. And what they think happened was that she left the house the day of the shooting. Mm -hmm. She parked her truck in the hotel parking lot, watches from a wooded area while Stephen and Heather exchange Carson, and then she walks over, argues with Heather, and shoots her right in the head. In front of that kid. And the baby was in the car. Yeah. Like, what if you had missed, you dumbass? Right. And then she walked away and just left the baby in the car. Yeah. Just walked away. Yeah. Like, I did what I had to do. Goodbye. And, oh, by the way, I guess somebody will either kidnap you or they'll save you. But not my problem. Right. I got to get to get and get my ice cream. Right. Then she gets back in her car and goes, drives to see her parents and stops off for ice cream on the way. Well, and then the, goes and sits with her parents. Do on the way home from murder, you right. go get ice cream. Yeah, sits with her parents like nothing's happened. No big deal. Gosh. Yeah. Dumbass. <sighs> um, they do not believe that Stephen had anything to do well, I would with it. Not. Yeah. But it makes me wonder if that girlfriend did. I don't think so. No. I really don't. It, when you see the mother, she's maniacal. She's just, 
She's just terrible. She's just terrible. I mean, for her to act on her own that way, like, what a, like, don't you even consider what your son would want? Right. Yeah, no, she was insistent that he was going to have full custody of that baby. Because she Period. wanted that baby. She That's wanted why. that baby. They lived in the house with her, and she wanted that baby to be there. Oh, yeah. So, the jury finds her guilty of murder. And Good. she is sentenced to life. Pack up your lipstick, lady. You're going to You're the You're going to the big slower. house. Take your wig. And Take get your, the fuck out. Your flippy floppy wig with the broom and the broom <laughs> hair and and your lipstick. Don't forget your lipstick because you're gonna need that in prison. Yeah. <laughs> so Heather's parents ended up getting custody of Carson. Unfortunately, Heather's mother died unexpectedly in 2014. And now Heather's father is raising Carson alone. Wait. He didn't get custody. Stephen did not get custody. After all of that. He didn't. He, see, his mom screwed him too. Yep. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. That's just disgusting. I know. She ruined it for everybody. Is she still living? Yeah, this just happened in uh, 2014. Where is she in prison? It did not say. I think we need to go on a prison tour. I, I've got some people I need to have a conversation with. I, I would imagine they've got a prison in Snellville, Georgia. they got to have one around there. Close by. Yeah. We've got some people to talk to in Atlanta. We could just go to Snellville. There you go. Because I would go on a prison tour and let people know y'all are assholes. Asshole. Yeah. What, and we're what? on to you. Right. Not just your people. The people around you know you're an asshole. We know you're an asshole, too. Yeah. Because you're an asshole. <laughs> On a global level. You know, they need to come out with a show called Assholes That Kill. Yes. Yeah. Well, which would be anybody, really. Right, but instead of, like, wives that kill, clergy yeah. that kills, assholes that kill. That's a very wide net. Yeah. <laughs> Get them all. We don't anybody. have to put them as clergy, as wives, as no. husbands, as kin. <laughs> no. Just all of them. Yeah, or just maybe it should be a show called Murderers or Assholes. Murderers or Assholes. Mm -hmm. And then you just prove... What their murder did to the people around them that made them like an extra special asshole. Yeah, I just don't think they care. This woman just didn't care. She well, didn't I care about her son. She would just get beaten and maybe, you know, handled a little bit in prison. One could only hope. One could only hope. Jackass. Oh, what a nasty bitch. Mm -hmm. How old was this woman? Uh, she was young. Oh, you mean the mother? The mother. The, the killer. She looked like she was probably in her 50s. Oh, she lost herself. She lost it. She lost her marbles. Yeah. Well, it's hard to say, too. I mean, I don't know. Was she that? I mean, her son did see him when in the interviews. She's got a temper on her, but. Well, no shit. Would she? I just can't imagine that she would do this. Still. People are dumb. They are. Yeah, That's she ruined mean. it. So. Murders are meanies. Yes, they are. They're mean. And it's a tragic loss for that family. It really is. Um, oh, poor kid Carson. Mm. Growing up with his grandfather. Yeah, and then, you know, he really lost two parents. He really did. Because he lost his mom, but he, he eventually lost his dad. Right, and his grandmother. And his grandmother and his dad's girlfriend. I mean, these are all people that could have been, he could have had... A really nice big family tree full right. of love, and instead she murdered his just, village. That's what well, she did. She axed down half his tree. Yeah, Jeez. because she wanted her way. Village murderer. I know. Biatch. So that's it. That's what okay. I've got. That's right, the first well, murder I've got for you. What's happening? Because things are smelling pretty tasty in okay, my kitchen. Okay, so this is like a really simple recipe, and I'm really surprised that it's so simple because it's such a delightful dish. <laughs> so the first thing that you do is you take your you take chopped dates. I know, don't turn your nose off. I did, but just stick with it. And I actually found them already chopped up, pitted and chopped up for me. You can get pitted dates and chop them yourself. You need um, one and a three quarter cup of that. You put some baking soda on it and put some boiling water on it, and it softens them. Okay. And you set those aside, and then you cream together. Butter and sugar until it's light and creamy, and then you add in a couple eggs and mix it to combine. And then this calls for self-rising flour. Okay. So um, you take your self-rising flour and you 
put that and the dates with the water on them into the bowl that you just creamed your sugar and eggs. Oh, okay, so you don't strain the dates. No. Mm -hmm. All put right. Put it in there with the water. Interesting. And then you fold that in there. So I took it off the mixer stand and actually hand folded it. Oh. Okay, because I've learned through the cooking shows that hand folding it is what helps give it a lot of air. Okay, fancy. Yes. She's fancy trout. Fancy. So that went into a prepare. It was I sprayed it. <coughs> Excuse me. It's a greased eight by eight pan. So now I'm working on the caramel sauce. Oh, oh. That caramel sauce is brown sugar, butter, and evaporated milk. You put it over medium heat, and um, I keep I stir it a little bit here and there, but it needs to be on medium heat until it comes to a bowl. I love Oil. a good caramel sauce. <coughs> Sorry, here's my cold. <clears throat> Once that comes to a boil, you're going to remove that from the heat and start in a teaspoon of vanilla. Did you double the caramel sauce recipe? Because it would be awfully good over some ice cream. I didn't. Okay. But we could because I have enough stuff to, to go and do it again. Right. If we need to. So, um, yeah. So, <laughs> I have enough. So, what I'm doing with this cake... Because normally what you would do is you would cut it into serving sizes mm -hmm. and then you would pour that warm caramel sauce over your cake to serve it. Right. But because I'm not serving it right this minute, I'm going to serve it to my husband for our New Year's Eve whoa, dinner. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> I'm going to give whoa. you some. I'm going to leave some here for you. Right. And then I'm going to take some home to the hubby. So I'm turning it into a poke cake. Because he really just needs a piece. I agree, but I also want to take a piece home for my son. Because he loves this stuff. He doesn't live with you anymore. No, he's coming over tomorrow. Oh, my gosh. She's always trying to get stuff out of here. <laughs> so, anyway, um, I am going to take, um, once that cake comes out and cools for a second. We're going to have to have a contract about this whole baking part. <coughs> We're going to have to settle up and say, okay, we bake. I get half, you get half. You are one person that lives doesn't here. Doesn't matter. I have multiple people, and I your son doesn't it. even eat half the crap we make. I know, but I can freeze it no. and eat it on another night. Shut up. This is what's going to happen. <laughs> so anyway, I'm turning this to a poke cake, so I'm going to take the end of a round wooden spoon handle and poke holes all through the cake, and then I'm going to pour the warm caramel sauce into the cake All right. like that, and it's going to soak it up. And then when I serve it, I'll just cut a piece, heat it in the microwave till it's just hot, and then put a little whipped cream on it. Oh, nice. So I think that's how I'll serve it up. So, yeah. Um, I don't know how you're serving up your shit, but that's up to you. I'll have mine with a scoop of ice cream and a little warm caramel sauce poured over top. Okay. <laughs> so um, while your cake's cooking and your caramel's cooking, <laughs> do you want to talk about murder? I absolutely do. Okay. I absolutely do. So I set my timer, it said between 30 and 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. I set it for 33 minutes. So okay. If it's not quite done, it needs to be, like if you stick a toothpick in it, I think we have a cake tester, right? We do. That should come out clean, or, um, and so it might need a little bit more time. Right. Also, watch the caramel sauce. You don't want it to boil hard. Right. But it does need to come up with some bubbles. Okay. And then you remove it from the heat. All right. So... <clears throat> I'll leave the recipe right there. You leave that recipe right there, and I'll come in and finish. I know. She's the finisher. I'm the finisher. Oh, man. I'm going to get my drink, too. Yes. My throat is ridiculous. So, while we're making this transition, I wanted to bring something up real quick. Okay. Let's hear it. So, <clears throat> sorry for me clearing my throat. Um, let's say you accidentally stumbled upon the link to this podcast. Okay. Or let's say you know us or you know our mom or you know somebody that knows us and they said, hey, you got to listen to this podcast. Well, we want you to know that this podcast is about sensitive stuff. It's murder. We get it. It's serious. It's sensitive. But because of the way that we were raised and we rebelled, <laughs> we find it entertaining. If you don't find this entertaining, if you are turned off by us joking, we don't make fun of the victims. We try really hard not to unless they've done something completely stupid to get themselves into this stupid situation. But most of the time, we don't do, we don't, we don't victim shame. 
but we do make fun of the murderer. Sometimes we make fun of their circumstances, their decisions, their family, whatever. We feel like it's free reign because they're murderers. We also find it funny somehow. So this is, this is meant for entertainment. We find it entertaining. But if you stumbled upon this link and you're listening to this and you're like, what in God's name is doing, are these people doing? Please don't call our mama. Please don't. don't Just call turn mama. it off. You don't even have to tell us that you turned it off. It's not going to hurt our feelings because it's all about entertainment and people like all different types of entertainment. Yeah. And if and you're not entertained by this, by all <coughs> means, shut it down. Shut that off. Shut Go down. find a different podcast on like yoga or health yeah. or positivity or whatever. If you're, if you're our great aunt and you're like, oh, look at these girls. They're so funny. And what I can't believe doing? those girls have said the F word. Oh and then Lord. please turn it off. It's fine. You don't have to tell us. Don't. If for some reason you're going to stick it out with us, we would love to have you with us on this really wild ride. It's wild. But also... Send us an email and let us know how much you like it. If you have updates on any of the murders that we've covered, we send us updates and we'll talk about it. Or if you have a murder of your own, did you grow up next door to a murderer? Oh my gosh! Do you have There's a murderer in our fam in your family? Yeah. Did do you know somebody that murdered somebody? Right. Like tell oh us. Oh my gosh! Do you have more information and inside stories about one murder that we've talked about? Exactly. Email us and we will talk about it. We'll put your name out there and we'll appreciate that you've contacted us and that you've st stuck with us. We hope that you all are enjoying it. But again, please don't call my mama. Don't call mama. One of the reasons is because I, when I do the podcast, I actually try to keep in my mind for an entertainment value or an entertainment standard. Am I going through this podcast? Am I putting my genuine self out there? And would my mother be shocked to hear me say this? And if that the answer is yes, then we're going to keep it. You're doing it, it right. <laughs> so please don't involve her in our affairs because that's going to get ugly. So anyway, our email address is murder.sugarcoated at gmail.com and we would love for you to send us an email and let us know that you listened, you enjoy it. You, If you want any of the recipes that we talk about, we'll send you a recipe. If you want a picture of trout, we'll send you a picture of trout. Oh, God, he's adorable. <clears throat> he's not that cute. Super um, cute. He's got kind of an attitude issue. No, he's so sweet. So anyway, with that, I'm going to start my murder. Let's hear it. And the reason that I preempted this murder with this jibber-jabber that I just went through is because... This is a crazy murder. Oh gosh. And it's a little dicey and I can't it's wait. it's a little heavy and it's a little gruesome and I'm probably going to make fun. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because it's a little zany to me. Uh, yeah. So, it is about this dude named Jerry. His name was Jerome. He went Jerry? Jerry. He went by um he went by Jerry, but his name was Jerome and his last name is Brudos. All right. And some people listening to this might be familiar with him because he's pretty infamous. I don't want to make him famous, but he is pretty infamous. I remember hearing about him <coughs> just a little bit, not a whole lot, but a little bit on that show Mindhunter, which I love. Yes. So when I, when I saw that episode of Mindhunter, I was so excited that I was shouting out facts <laughs> before they said <laughs> the fact. And my husband was having a hard time even hearing what they were saying because I was saying it two seconds before they said it. And he was like, I don't know if I'm going to, I think I'm going to have to rewatch this episode without you in the room. <laughs> so whatever. But I got the facts right because I had already done the research on this murder. So <clears throat> let me tell you something, some stuff about little Jerry. First of all, he shares a birth date with you. Oh, Jerry. <sighs> But he's 30 years older. Thank God. So, January 31st, 1939, he is born to his parents, Henry and Eileen. And he also has an older brother, Jerry. No, Larry. Oh, so, now they've... That's like they've, Jerry and Jerry? <clears throat> no, Larry and Jerry. He was born in South Dakota. Um, when he was five years old, his parents were... They were all living in Portland, Oregon. His dad was in the agriculture um industry and he was they were financially stable okay jerry um became fascinated with women's high-heeled shoes at the age of five. Oh my he found a pair of open-toed high-heeled shoes in a junkyard while playing alone which Why? that's a red flag Hello. to me He's nobody fine. seems to want to address the fact that this kid is playing alone in the junkyard oh, i don't God. know 
what the heck is happening? I don't know if this was their answer to daycare. Like when they were working, they junk, dropped him at the junkyard and said, we'll come back and Go pick you up, uh, whatever. So he found a um, pair of high-heeled shoes and he wore them home. Oh. Oh. And his mother scolded him repeatedly for wearing those shoes. And she eventually burned them. <clears throat> now, I do want to also say that they, his parents were really happy when they were pregnant with their second child. They really wanted a daughter, especially the mother. She, I guess she was over being the only woman in the house. So she really wanted a daughter and was very disappointed when Jerry was born oh. that he was not a daughter, that oh, he was no. a son. And so there were multiple times in his life where she reminded him of that fact as well. Wow. No, so, we know that's not good. That's not nice. So, um, all right, so we're going to move on. When he's about six or seven years old, he's in the first grade, and they're in California now. And his first grade teacher wears high-heeled shoes every day. She she keeps two pairs in the classroom, I guess, if, in case a heel breaks or whatever. Always good to be prepared. <clears throat> I completely agree. I have um, paper plate shoes that are under my desk because one time at work my heel broke on my shoe and and some guys were trying to glue it back together but I wasn't going to walk around the building barefoot because that's disgusting so um a couple of my friends took some paper plates and cut them up and stapled them together and made them look like little slides oh. and put the and they even painted the Nike symbol on oh them and God. so those are my emergency slippers in case I have a kind of a Shoe emergency. Perhaps I should rethink it, but at the time it was really it was really fun. <laughs> okay, I'm surprised you didn't fall. Paper plate shoes—they're very slick. Well, I just I shuffled along. <laughs> it's not like I could pick my feet up and not have them come off right, anyway. Right. So they weren't exactly fitted to size. Understood. Yes, thank God I had a fresh pedicure and I didn't have to be embarrassed about that. Oh, thank God. <clears throat> so anyway, um, Jerry ends up hiding one of the spare pairs of high-heeled shoes from his teacher because he's going to take them home with him. But a classmate finds out that he did it. Oh, damn. And he confesses to the, Jerry confesses to it. And he is scolded very heavily by his teacher. And he's very embarrassed because she does it in front of the whole classroom. Oh, no. So we're building. We're building. We're building a warped mind here. <laughs> we're some, doing, we're all, we're doing some stuff. Right. Okay. So... The family, <clears throat> all right, so the next year, Jerry fails the second grade. Ugh. He has, he's gone through measles, several bouts of sore throat, swollen glands, laryngitis. He gets a couple of operations on his extremities to fight fungal infections. Well, do you think that has anything to do with playing in the junkyard? I have a feeling that he could have picked up a fungus or two. And finding some old, nasty shoes and wearing them oh around. I mean, can God. you imagine? <laughs> oh, gosh. So, anyway, um, he complains often of frequent headaches and, and tells his parents and ev eventually a doctor that the headaches make him unable to see clearly. Uh. So, they take him. This stupid eye doctor decides, well, he's probably just making it up, so we're going to give him some fake glasses. Right. And then he'll just grow out of complaining about this, because this is a brilliant doctor. Oh, yeah. And that makes sense. <clears throat> the headaches persist, and eventually they decide, well, we're just going to test his IQ. Oh. Like, what does this have to do with a kid with headaches? Right. And it comes back that he's got a normal IQ. He's not dumb. Not dumb. And he can see fine. He really can't see. They just are stupid, and they think he's just he's just pretending. Oh. So, I mean, the guy does wear glasses throughout the rest of his life. <laughs> but, the, I mean, this I don't even know where they found this doctor. Probably at the junkyard. Probably. So, if that's done, you can pull him off the heat if you think it's done. I don't know. <clears throat> I was just going to say. It's not thick like caramel. Okay. Well, so, has it boiled? Yeah. Okay. How long did it boil for? Um... Well, it still kind of boils. I've got the heat turned down. It's supposed to simmer for five minutes. Okay. But it's still... Um, Not real thick. Yeah. I would... Um, I'd just let it simmer for a little while longer. And it, eventually, it'll reduce. 
Because I don't think it's it's a sauce. It's not like a sticky caramel. Yeah. So it's kind of in between. Probably like the consistency of gravy. Okay. All right. So back to Jerry. The weird dude with the <clears throat> headaches and the oh. So um. So eventually, his family moves a couple more times, and they end up in Grants Pass, Oregon. And while they're there, their neighbors had several teenage daughters. Oh. And Jerry began to sneak into the house with with the brother of the girls. Oh. And he would play with all their clothes. Oh. Okay. So at this time, his shoe fetish now starts to grow and expands to women's undergarments as well. As well. So eventually, his his we're going to move to like 1952-ish. His brother is 16 years old, and, and of course, any 16-year-old boy is pretty curious about the female nude body. <clears throat> and he, I guess he drew some pictures of nude female bodies, his older brother, but Jerry finds them. Okay. And then it, Jerry gets caught with them. Oh, no. Oh, that damn older <laughs> brother. But Jerry takes the fall for his brother, doesn't want to get his brother in trouble. But again, he is scolded very heavily by their mother who is she seems to have a growing disdain for anything sexual with these boys oh. so um around 1955 jerry is going through puberty and his mother she's i mean she's a force to be reckoned with anytime there was a stain on jerry's sheets she would make a big deal of it and make Jerry hand wash the sheets himself and get the stains out himself and made a big deal about it. That is so cruel. Yeah, so she wouldn't put the sheets with the other laundry. It was disgusting. It was foul. Well, if, if the other brother had it, no big deal. I don't know. <clears throat> I don't know how what her interaction was with that kid, but I know this happened to Jerry. Okay. Um, and I think that, you know, this probably had come out with many multiple interviews with psychiatrists and, you know, people like that that were trying to study what, how we got this monster. So anyway, um, so he starts to fantasize about capturing a girl and forcing her to obey his commands and beg for mercy. So he's really starting to fantasize about some weird stuff. So his family moves again. They keep moving. And the reason they moved this time is because the older brother starts studying electronics at Oregon State University. Mm -hmm. And so Jerry continues his habit of stealing shoes and undergarments from women. And then he uses them to enhance his um, self-pleasuring. Mm -hmm. I guess I'll say it like that. So then in summer of 55, Jerry steals some undergarments from an 18-year-old girl. Okay. Jerry. And he decides he wants to get a nude photograph of this girl. He had a camera. I know he liked to take a lot of pictures. And he talks her into coming to his house and going and going in with him. And he was going to help her get the undergarments back. Like it was like, oh, I, feel, I think I might know who took them. So if you come over to my house, then we'll go get them. I'll help you get them back. Right. But what he actually did was she came over. He wasn't there. Oh. But this masked man comes in, <laughs> holds her at knife point, and forces her to remove her clothing and take some photos of her. And then the man left, and as the girl was getting dressed and fleeing, Jerry runs in and said, Oh my gosh, I was locked in a barn, oh. but I saw this masked man come in. Are you okay? Oh gosh. She was like, uh... Yeah, I'm good. And then she lets the police know what happened. <clears throat> so the next year, he lures a 17-year-old girl into his car, and he drove her to a deserted farmhouse where he beat her profusely. A couple stopped by. I don't know why they stopped by this farmhouse. It's weird. But they actually um, stopped the crime from happening. And... Um, he said that he had actually come in to help the girl, that he had heard her screams, and that he had come in to help, and then the intruder ran off, but they didn't believe him, and they reported it to the police. 
Okay. Okay. So eventually, um, he confessed to the police that it was him. Okay. Okay. In Jerry's house and car, they found some undergarments, some photos, some photograph um, equipment, and he was arrested for assault and battery. He was then committed to the state mental hospital for evaluation and treatment. They diagnosed him with adjustment reaction of adolescence with sexual deviation and fetish, fetishism. Oh. Like what? I don't even what know is what that, that is. Is there an acronym? Can we do a A R A S D F or something? Like that's a whole mouthful. So anyway, while he's in the hospital, he's still allowed to go and attend um, high school while really? he's in the hospital. Really? He's still allowed to attend, yeah, during the day, and then he goes and sleeps there. So we have a deviant, a sexual <coughs> deviant with a fetish, a, a fetish of high heel shoes and undergarments, and undergarments of yeah. girls, and, and we're going to send him to high school. school. That sounds familiar to me, but we'll talk about that on another <laughs> podcast. So anyway, um, he also at the time is diagnosed as borderline schizophrenic, but that is also at that time, that was the, um, it was like the soup du jour of diagnoses for the psychiatric community. Right. Everybody got, everybody with a problem got that label. Right, right. So um, it was just, a, it was a label. I think that they just didn't know what to do with this guy. So he stayed in that mental hospital for eight to nine months, and eventually they discharged him and deemed him to no longer be a danger to society. Really? Absolutely. He just got cured. So that's in 1956. All right. Okay. Okay. So he's in his 20s. Yeah. So then he actually, no, he's 17. He's 17. Okay, he's 17. So the next year, 18, he goes back to high school in Corvallis, which is where his parents are now. And he ends up graduating high school finally, but he was in the lower 30% of his graduating class with a low GPA. He decides, well, I'm going to go to college. So he decides to try to go to Oregon State University. He ends up at Salem Tech Vocational School. He's trying to get a degree in advanced technology, but he does not attend classes regularly, and eventually he just drops out. So, <clears throat> now he's 20 years old, and he joins the Army. All right, let's put so the he's, sexual deviant in the military. He's stationed in California, He did his ba but he did his basic training in Georgia, mm -hmm. and he enters with the rank of E2, which is enlisted. And at that point, he started to have dreams about a Korean girl that would seduce him. Oh, no. And so, these dreams become... <clears throat> overwhelming for him and he decides to go and talk to the army chaplain okay the army chaplain refers him to an army psychiatrist <laughs> and that psychiatrist um actually had him discharged from the army because of his bizarre obsessions oh no so now they have opened the door and let him back out into society right no they've longer shamed in him. they've shamed yes. him they said dude you're weird get out yes we don't want you so um Late fall of 1960, he's 21 years old. He moves back into his parents, but they force him to live in their shed. Oh, no. Nobody wants him. Poor Jerry. Okay. I can say poor Jerry for a minute. Well, just for that one <coughs> second. Since okay. It. One night after running an errand, he became excited by a young girl who was walking along the road, and he followed her home. He strangled her until she was unconscious and then stole her shoes. <laughs> he then began sleeping with her shoes in an attempt to feel more powerful. Oh, gosh. Yes. 1960, he obtains his FCC license and begins working at a local radio station where he meets his wife, Darcy. He gets married. Okay. A person marries him. She was 17 at the time, and she married him pretty much out of rebellion against her parents because they did not approve of her relationship. So that's really swell. <laughs> so when they get married, he is 22 and she's 17. And um, after a while, they have a daughter named Megan. And um, they move all up and down the West Coast because Jerry really can't keep a job. Imagine that. I don't know why he can't keep a job. Because people keep wearing high heel shoes around him and he can't think straight. <laughs> So, um, he eventually gets a job as a technician in West Salem, Oregon, 
and he eventually loses, loses that job because he can't show up for work. <clears throat> so then they go to um, Portland, and um, he starts working as an electrician, and Darcy gets pregnant again, and he is very excited, and he's hoping for a son. But Darcy wouldn't allow him to be present during the birth of their son. So he gets kicked out of the delivery room, and they have a son named Jason, but he feels very rejected, and so he regresses and starts stalking women again. So he stalks a woman, waits for her to fall asleep, breaks into her house, and attempts to steal the shoes. He was doing this one time, and the woman woke up, and Jerry choked her until she went limp, raped her. Now he's upping his behavior, oh. stole her shoes, and took off. Okay? And later on, he was electrocuted at work but um, and sustained minor damages but was never hospitalized. Oh. So, we're in January of 1968. He is 28 years old. He's about to turn 29. Okay? Okay. Along comes Linda Slauson. I really kind of have a... Um, kindred connection to Linda. Okay. Because she, at the time, was a door-to-door -door encyclopedia salesman. Oh, yes. You're very familiar. Yes, you because that. I, that was once um, one of the job. I'll say not a career, but a job that I took on as a youngster. And um, now when I read this, I don't know how I'm still alive and not dead in some guy's basement. With no, with no shoes. With no shoes. So... This lady goes into Jerry's house, and he convinces her to go downstairs to his quote-unquote workshop, a.k.a. garage. No. If anybody asks you <coughs> to go down to your workshop, garage, downstairs. Yeah, but you know what's scary? Sales, I know, no. but when you would knock on these doors, your whole goal in the first five minutes was to get into the house. Oh, my gosh. Are you Because serious? you wanted to go in and sit with them in a relaxed environment. So they wanted you to go into the home and sit at the kitchen table or sit in the den with these people and have a face-to-face -face intimate conversation. That was like our the goal. 90s, right? Yeah. You were doing that? Absolutely. That well, uh, it wasn't 90 yet. It was in the 80s. 80s. Yeah, like mid to late 80s. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, that's what they would do. That and is And terrifying. it was horrible because I would be dropped off in these neighborhoods by myself. I didn't have a car. They would drop you off, and they'd say, hey, we'll meet you back at such and such a place in about four hours. Go sell some books. So, yeah. So, anyway, this lady goes in. She goes down to his garage where he hits her in the back of the head with a two-by-four and strangles her to death. Before he disposes of her body, he removes her clothes and uses the undergarments from his collection to have the corpse model. He takes some pictures of her in oh. all the lingerie. Wait, it gets better. No. He cuts off her left foot no. and keeps it in the freezer to model his high-heeled shoes. No. So, that makes me want to puke. No, no, no. He later dumps her body over a bridge and gets rid of it. <clears throat> July of 1968, this girl named Stephanie Vicko is reported missing in Portland. Hmm. November of 1968, um, Jan Susan Whitley, or Whitney, sorry, 23-year-old college student at University of Oregon, goes missing. March 1969. So, hello, was anybody paying attention? Karen Sprinkler, she's a 19-year-old college student, and she goes missing. Two girls from that college campus tell the police that a large man dressed in drag was in the parking garage where Karen's abandoned car was found on the day that she went missing. Oh. So now he's dressing in the women's clothing and I guess trying to lure other women. So in April of 1965, he meets Sharon Wood in a parking garage at Portland State University. She attempts to, um, to fight off his attack and she bites his thumb until it bleeds. Oh. Jim or Jerry beats her unconscious but an oncoming car causes him to flee the scene. But the police, I mean, what the hell's happening? They fail to make any connections between this event and the event of these other three missing girls. All in the same area, and for some reason they don't connect it. That's crazy. So in April of 1969, um, Jerry encounters a 14-year-old named Leanne Br Brumley, 
and he attempts to abduct her into his car, but she escapes. Bless her heart, that 14-year-old girl. You go, girl. She outran that stupid ass. So in, so that's on April 22nd. April 23rd, Linda Dawn Saley is reported missing. Her car is found abandoned in a parking garage, and police then finally go, ding, 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 ding. Oh, look, we've got a connection. We might have a guy that's, that's a habitual killer, okay? Right. Um, Jerry had posed as a police officer to lure him into the car and, and eventually confessed to killing her by as, asphyxiation. Mm. So that was in April. In May of 1969, a local fisherman discovers this lady, um, Linda's body in a river and her body had been tied to an auto transmission to weight her down. Oh. Two days later, Karen Sprinkler, who had been missing, her body is still is found 50 feet away from where Linda's body was, and she had been tied to an old engine. Oh. Seems like he's going back to the junkyard, if you ask me. Yeah. And um, she, that's how she was had been submerged. She had had both of her breasts cut off <gasps> and filled oh. with paper towels. Oh, my God. And... Jerry had put a bra on him to conceal that, but it turns out that we will later find that he had used her breasts as paperweights in his in his Wait, he workshop. put a bra on the lady? Yes. Oh, okay, you said it on him. No, on he her. had put a bra on, on the her. lady, the lady's body okay. to conceal the mangling of oh, her breasts. Oh, gosh. <clears throat> yes. So now he decides he's going to start just f phone just randomly phoning dorm rooms of your of Oregon State University co-eds oh. and just try to get blind dates with girls. Oh, my gosh. And just remember, he is 30 years old. He is, quote, unquote, he's married and has two children. Oh, my gosh. Okay? So he starts just, and he actually gets, he gets people to date. But he gets girls to come out and date him. That's what's so crazy. So at this point, um, police are on to the fact that there's a pattern with this killer and that he and they start staking out areas where young, attractive women are present. How do you do that? Isn't that know. like every random street in America? Right. Like college, college campuses? Yeah. So um, there was a female student who claimed to have gone out on one of the blind dates and she was able to give a description of this man named Jerome Brutos. Oh. So he ends up calling her back a second time because I guess he wanted a second date with her. <laughs> and she says yes, but then she calls police immediately and tells the police, this is where I'm supposed to meet him for my date. So police show up and <clears throat> question him at this girl's residence hall when he comes to pick, up, pick her up. And he cooperates with them. He answers questions. And eventually... Um, his information comes back as legitimate. He didn't lie about who he was. So um, they just let him go. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. yeah. He have, seemed like, like a DNA nice guy. Or yes. any of the forensic analysis like we have today. So yeah, they just like, got to go on. Like, you don't, well. you don't look like a killer. Mm -hmm. or you, you gave us your real name, so you must be good. You're good. But actually, they kept his address. Oh, thank God. And so eventually, they decide, well, we're just going to... We're just going to stop by his house and see what we see. And at the house, they see several suspicious items in the garage, and oh. they start building a case. What are you doing? I'm you, just doing things in the kitchen. Okay. Because you shouldn't worry about it. I shouldn't worry about it, because I don't know what she's up to in there. <laughs> so, eventually, they have enough um, evidence to obtain an arrest warrant for him. <clears throat> he attempts to flee, but they serve him with the warrant, and they... Um, they actually serve him for a warrant for the attempted abduction of Leanne Brumley. So she had escaped a month earlier from him, and she was able to give the police a very good description. And so um, they take him downtown, and they start to talk to him. So from the, from the jail in June, he tries to convince his wife to go and burn his clothes that are in his quote unquote workshop oh, and other evidence, which I'm sure would be the foot. Oh, 
Oh, no. <laughs> and the high heel shoes that he's collecting. But Darcy does not do it. She's like, uh, I know. No, <clears throat> you're good. You just stay right here. Sure, honey, I'll take care of that. So thing. eventually, they um, get a confession out of Jerry. And at first, he confesses to the attempted kidnapping. But then he also <laughs> starts to confess about some of the other women. And um, he confessed that the two women that they had just discovered their bodies, that he had done that. Oh. So then he's arraigned on the murder of, um, he's also arraigned on the murder of Karen Sprinkler, which was like a 19-year-old co-ed that was missing. He pleads not guilty by reason of insanity. Oh, of course he does. Did I say guilty? Guilty. I didn't hear you say guilty Okay, this time. I'm trying not to say guilty. I love that's, guilty. No, because that's stupid. That's my cousin It's Vinny. guilty. My cousin Vinny. Guilty. Loved that movie. Yeah, me too. Obviously, I picked up some language from there. <laughs> He's guilty. So, um, because he pleads not guilty by <laughs> reason of insanity, he gets visited by a couple of psychiatrists who put him through some different testing. And um, eventually, they say he is not criminally insane and he has an above average IQ. And so he is diagnosed with antisocial personality manifested by fetishism, transvestism, mm -hmm. ex exhibitionism, voyeurism, and especially sadism. So he's got all the isms. Yeah, -ism. He got he's full of isms. So um, he he is I'm not crazy. Though. So this is in June of 1969. He's 30 years old. And as they continue to build the case against him, he's eventually charged with three counts of first-degree murder for the murders of Jan Whitley, Linda Saley, and Karen Sprinkler. He decides to revoke his plea of not guilty by reason of insanity and pleads guilty. And that day, he is sentenced to three consecutive life sentences because there was no death penalty in Oregon. He was not charged with the murder of Linda Slauson because her body was never found. Oh. Yes. That's heartbreaking for the family, but... Yes. So, here's something kind of interesting. Okay, let's hear it. July of 19... So, he's in jail in June. Okay, he's in jail. He's been convicted and sentenced. He's done. Okay. July of 1969, 12 women went missing in his... In Brudos's area during the time he was... Oh. Holy shit. What? 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 What's happening? Hello? Where'd she go? Yeah, okay. So, when this is he... late breaking okay. news. What's happening? Late breaking news is, so while he is, I guess while he was out, while they were building their case, 12 other women went missing in his area. And, and in July, they begin to investigate all of those women, and they're trying to uncover the whereabouts of them. And one of the neighbors implicated his wife Darcy in oh. one of the murders, claiming that she helped him carry a body from the garage. Oh, no. She is charged with aiding and abetting and first-degree murder of Karen Sprinkler. She testifies Darcy, and claims that, you wicked bitch. that she had no involvement. She was found not guilty. So, guilty. So, in August of 1970, she finally decides she's going to divorce Jerry. Like, no shit, woman. This guy has got women's clothes in this... So, in another article that I read, he had rigged up this work, what he called his workshop, his photography workshop in his garage. And he he told Darcy she was never allowed to enter the garage. He set up an intercom system. So, if she needed him, she could call him on the intercom system. Or if she needed to come in to the workshop, she had to announce herself on the intercom system and give him a certain amount of time before he came in. Uh, that's normal. I'm sorry. I no longer trust Darcy. I think Darcy is a dipshit. She knew what was happening and she didn't do anything about no, it. No, because she was just happy. It was them that that was, that was happening to so she could just live her life with her kids and do whatever she wanted to do. So anyway, <clears throat> she, um, she actually divorces him, changes her name, and moves away. And she also obtained a court order forbidding her children from visiting or writing their father and from him communicating with them. So she at least had the forethought to say, 
well, this guy is a maniacal monster. I really don't want him to give my children any kind of impressions that this was okay. Right. So, um, so between 1969 and 1971, while he's in prison, he is he get he has a lot of trouble. He's hit in the head with a bucket of water, and he is frequently beaten by fellow inmates. So, um, in ni January of 1970, he is treated for rectal bleeding. <gasps> But they were be, they were classified as being caused by hemorrhoids or other. Oh, other, okay. <laughs> other. You know those prison hemorrhoids. Yeah, they get you every time. <laughs> and I don't feel bad for him. I don't no. feel one freaking thing for him. No. So, um, between January of 1960, or whenever he goes into prison, June of 1969 through January of 1971, um, actually May of 1977, his lawyers continue to fight for him and they go through all the appeals courts and the last appeal rejection came through in May of 1977. But in 99, at the age of 60, he comes up for parole and um, parole is not granted and they make it clear to the victim's family that he will never be set free. And they actually at that time tell Jerry you can just stop showing up for your parole hearings because we're never going to let you out. Wow. Good can news. Can they do that? Yeah, they can. They have to have the hearing, but the parole board can say, we're never going to let you out. You're never getting out. And no matter how many times you come up for parole, right. we're never going to set you free. So, yeah. So, anyway, um, <clears throat> there's just, I mean, that's, that's him. And back then, they did not have the name of what type of killer he was. Um, they they called it a habitual killer right. or that kind of stuff. And so, or a patterned killer, but it wasn't until later on that they came up with the term serial killer, but he for sure was a serial killer and he for sure was sick in the head and his mother had a lot to do with it. I think so. They didn't really say a lot about his dad. But they talked about his mom a lot, how influential she was in his life and how deranged she was, that her overreaction to any type of sexual growth in him, kind of, you know. So, and then the fact that she wanted him to be a girl and the fact that they let him roam around alone in a junkyard. Oh my gosh, there's so like, many. At five things years that old. Wrong, right? What the hell? What the hell? <sighs> yeah. So, anyway, that's my murder. And, um, that was pretty nasty. It was pretty, pretty gross. So um, I'm going to, we're going to take a break until our cake is ready. And then um, we're going to get, we're going to get it and taste it. So you all can find out the verdict on if this is a good recipe or not. So hold on and we'll be back in a minute. All right, sugar. All right. So I have poked holes in my cake. Yeah. And I think we've got a good caramel sauce going. I think the last one broke because we just probably cooked it a little bit too much. Yep. Um, so I say pour it over. Do you do you want to pour it? Or do you want me to pour it? I don't it? care. Just okay. get it poured. Pouring. And just try to get it even. It's a lot of pressure. I know, but that's why I want you to do it. Because I can tell you you did it wrong. It's <laughs> not nice. I know, but that's my, that's the way I do things. <laughs> All right. Try to get it like towards the edges. So it's really swimming in that stuff. All right. It's swimming in it. Swimming, swimming, swimming. Let's take a bite yes. and say goodbye. Cool. Over here, girl. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's take a bite. What are we going to use? What can we use? We can just use this. Yes. Okay. Here we go. Take a bite. Oh yeah. All right. Take a take a pinch. Okay. Got it. Got it. All right. What do you think? Mm. Ah, she hit me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. God, that's so good. Mm. Oh yeah. This is the recipe. So I got this recipe off of allrecipes.com. But if you want it, and um. You want it from me? Just email us again at murder.sugarcoated at gmail.com and we will 
gladly share this or any other recipe and we wish you well and we will see you soon and everybody just be sweet.